Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Uh, today's webinar has the title of What do we really know about Meniere's disease? And thank you for taking the, the time to come and join us whilst we, we kind of delve in a little bit more detail into Meniere's disease uh, and to what clinically we understand in relation to the symptoms and physiological changes associated with the underlying condition. Before we get started, let me just first introduce myself. Um, for those that uh, don't know me uh, or haven't come across my name before, my name is Darren Whelan, one of the international clinical trainers uh, at the Interacoustics Academy. I'm an audiologist by background and joined the Academy approximately 18 months ago, um, having worked for over 20 years in the United Kingdom, primarily as an audiologist um, and certainly leading on a diagnostic auditory and vestibular clinic in a very large ear, nose and throat and otolaryngology centre in the northeast of England. Um, my research background very much has looked at vestibular dysfunction and disorders in relation to conditions and also around the clinical utility of some of the assessments that we undertake. So I'm very familiar with the challenge that those of us that see patients who present with a dizziness, particularly episodic dizziness, propose to us in clinic. So today's intended learning outcomes uh, for the webinar are really for us to go back and have an overview of Menier's disease uh, and its evolution and theories or possible theories of pathophysiology. Alongside that, exploring what diagnostic testing we may be able to employ in suspected Menier's disease patients and then looking at the integration of some of those test findings. And then towards the uh, final part of the webinar, we'll also have a think around some of the mimicking pathologies and the challenge then in, in when we consider the management of their symptoms of the individual patient. Those, again, who see dizziness uh, frequently will be more than familiar with the fact that um, sometimes we have overlapping symptoms and pathologies that do uh, often present in a very similar way and really getting to the crux of which one is causing uh, the patient the the actual problem is really quite a challenge for us okay so let's let's start at the probably what is the natural beginning for looking at um, physiological and physiology of the inner ear uh, particularly in the vestibular system and that is really the very early work of florence who was a French professor of uh, comparative anatomy and did a lot of uh, groundbreaking work on uh, the both the mechanical properties of the inner ear in pigeons, uh, particularly in semicircular canal function back in 1824. Really, that inspired, I guess, probably some of the work that Prosper Menier had been uh, pursuing through his career um, when he was seeing dizzy patients, uh, patients who presented with dizziness in his clinic. And in fact, Prosper Menier is credited as being one of the first physicians who moved the idea of um, true rotatory vertigo or dizziness that's experienced by the patient from being predominantly a brain disorder, as it was reported in the literature um, back in the 1900s, to being something that may be implicated down towards the ear. And certainly those groundbreaking articles, six articles that he published in the Paris uh, Medical Journal in 1861, uh, sadly, uh, at the very end of his life, uh, as he as he passed away in 1862, um, really then it gave us the framework for uh, what we now look at in terms of uh, Menier's disease, obviously named after himself. That then moves us on to Ewell. Now, Ewell's experiments and Ewell's laws, we're all familiar with, um, really provided that first scientific clue that um, semicircular canals were involved in the integration and regulation of balance and really then classifying, as we do, um, nystagmus and nystagmus direction uh, relative to um, what the disorder might be uh, in terms of either peripheral or central uh, dysfunction. And then moving towards where we're where we've been evolving over the last hundred or so years in terms of vestibular function and measuring uh, the properties uh, of the vestibular system. That brings us to the work of Robert Barani, um, who 
obviously in the early part of the 20th century published his groundbreaking work looking at uh, the chloric and rota rotatory chair effect um, and the corresponding eye movements by stimulating the semicircular canals. So thinking a little bit just of, of, of where the common thoughts are around the pathophysiology of Menier's disease uh, and the descriptor that Menier himself proposed. Now we know that and again, we'll explore this in a little bit more detail as we move through the webinar, that we're looking at things that are related uh, in this particular condition to inner ear change. So whether that's an auditory cochlear change, both hearing or tinnitus, dizziness, uh, perception of movement, sensitivity to movement, um, true rotatory vertigo as is, is often described as one of the symptoms, and also potentially some uh, pressure-like feelings in the ear. The actual literature underlying um, the pathophysiologic state in Menier's disease is sort of really to the crux of it is this endolymphatic high drops. And again, we'll, we can talk, discuss what, what we actually mean by endolymphatic high drops as we look at the um, detail of this webinar. However, the trigger to what may cause this endolymphatic high drops is actually not that well understood. Uh, and we will probably have some explanations, hopefully, as we pull together some of the literature uh, today to see why that might actually be the case. So the etiology or etiological factor, um, so the trigger that creates this process or mechanism that results in the condition of endolymphatic high drops and then subsequently the symptoms of Menier's disease are even to this day um, somewhat difficult to uh, understand fully. So thinking again just in, a in relation to the anatomy, there are reports and if we go back to Schuchnick's original theory of some of these mixed mechanical and chemical mechanisms related to endolymphatic high drop. And Schuchnick was first reported as the theory of Reisner's membrane ruptures second to this uh, endolymphatic duct distension. So that was based on a series of temporal bone studies looking at some of the changes that were evident in patients that had experienced symptoms related to Menier's disease. And the theory there with Shupnik was really this mixture of potassium infused perilymph bathing the, the basal surface of the hair cells to potentially toxic levels and resulting in these episodes of dizziness whilst this was present and also then subsequent um, functional change both in vestibular function and cochlear function over time. There's also observations that saccular high drops can extend into the amplia root of the semicircular canal and physically alter the function of the, the crystal ampullaris. Uh, some of those studies have looked at the explanation of why we may see a, a canal paresis or a vestibular hyperfunction in the affected ear in terms of the enlargement of the endolymphatic space pushing into the semicircular canal and decreasing its function. And also then we've got the other explanations in relation to the hearing change that we see with this hydropic cochlear saccular dysfunction accounting for the mechanical alteration of the traveling wave which is felt to play a part in the low frequency fluctuations of hearing loss. Obviously as we get further and further into the Menier's disease we see patients with much more fixed hearing losses both from a low frequency to a very flat loss as the disease progresses and damage to the inner ear structures is taking place. Now the endolymphatic duct and sac is often hidden away in our vestibular anatomy diagrams in our textbooks. So it's this little structure that sort of sits towards the back of the autolith organs branching out from the uh, adduct between the um, utricular and uh, saccular system, uh, coming along into effectively what is a, a bulb towards the end, often described as, as the endolymphatic sac or lake, where the endolymph itself is replenished um, and uh, ionically moderated. And again, we'll talk a bit more about that as well. In terms of the functions of this endolymphatic sac, again, these this list is, is fairly extensive because our understanding is not 100% complete, but certainly the reabsorption of water content of the endolymph, um, the ability to participate in ionic exchanges that I've just mentioned with the endolymph, the removal of metabolic and cellular debris um, floating around in the semicircular canals or in, from the autolith organs. Again, we're familiar with that in relation to thinking about the condition of benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo. The sac uh, is felt to have a process of 
removing uh, any of this debris that uh, is circulating through the actual inner ear structure. And also the immunal defense of the ear, uh, the secretion of sacin, uh, a protein that is used to increase felt to be used to increase the production of endolymph uh, within the system and also inhibits the reabsorption of sodium. So again, another factor in terms of the ionic preservation of, of endolymph uh, and its function within the inner ear structures. And um, there's also other things around uh, considering the removal of uh, or inactivation of viruses uh, within that system as well. So the, the thoughts around the endolymphatic sac are, are always evolving, uh, but also it plays, we can see, quite a pivotal role in just the protection uh, and preservation of inner ear function. As we start to move into looking at many in a little bit more detail, I think we still need to consider and take a moment just to think about what we see in our clinics, the prevalence of these peripheral vestibular lesions of which Meniere's disease fits in to that group. And we have several studies, and this one we're citing is Bath et al., quite a large study of 812 cases reviewed in a specialist dizzy uh, clinic. And what we can see is that peripheral vestibular disorders are often reported as being the highest presenting pathology. And that, that is not unsurprising to us if we're in an ear, nose or throat and otolaryngology centre that predominantly is the expected referral route for what we think is a, a peripheral vestibular condition, then those numbers should be relatively high if we've got successful um, direction of referrals. However, if we then combine that both with the central and peripheral uh, vestibular impairments, we're getting close to 70%. And then on top of that, we've got central or unknown pathologies. And we'll come back to that a little bit later as well. And that then really accounts for the majority of patients that we probably see in our clinic. And the challenge then really is to, uh, is to define uh, or diagnostically define where the lesion may be situated so that effective management can be considered. So thinking about many as disease across the lifespan. What we see within the reported literature is there are a couple of conditions, again, that we'll be considering in relation to potential mimics, I guess, of overlapping time frames. When we certainly look at the latter uh, fourth, fifth, sixth decade and, and beyond, what we see is sort of three conditions that probably have their greatest uh, prevalence or incidences. BPPV being our number one in our clinics with this positioning provoked dizziness and peaking somewhere around the 40 to 65 year age range. And many as disease being reported, certainly increasing over the, the latter parts of our adult life and with the highest reported population prevalence in the 50 to 80 year old group. And then also a newer entrant, although has been written about probably for a very similar amount of time as many as disease in reality. And in fact, Prosper Menya himself made reference to it in his six journal articles of migraine. And then obviously the variant of that we consider, which is migraine associated vertigo and also vestibular migraine, has a very similar peak around the same sort of time frame uh, chronologically. So just looking at, at one study here of the epidemiology of Menier's disease. So Fabrec et al. in 2007 looked at a survey of Menier's disease in their subspecialty referral clinic. And what they found is pretty much what we've just said there, in that as we reach the fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh decade, then we're seeing much greater prevalence of Menier's disease in the population. We may just need to pause for a moment there and just put a little caveat and um, consider these prevalence uh, per 100,000 of the population may also be influenced by other conditions that are misreported as many as disease as well. So we'll we'll come back to that um, and consider it as well. This also may be a factor when we talk about the epidemiology of Meniere's disease across the, the, the globe. One of the difficulties that we have is that the epidemiology is very poorly reported and partly that is probably to do with the nature of Meniere's disease. We know that it often presents in a very episodic way and can have a very long time frame before the symptoms become more consistent. And so the actual reporting of the symptoms may vary just purely on that basis. So to give an example, um, in Japan, there are studies that report the um, the prevalence of Menier's disease being around 17 per 100,000 of the population, with uh, Finland um, having a reported 
uh, prevalence of uh, 43 per 100,000 of the population, with Spain at, at 75, the USA at 91. And obviously these numbers move around if, depending on what age range we're looking at, but this is just as a general across the entire age of the population. Interestingly, the last one we pop up there is the UK, and the one of the studies that reports in the UK is 275 per 100,000. There's an interesting relationship to reported um, many as disease in that particular population uh, study as that was a self-reported questionnaire so interestingly what that might actually reflect is what the patient has been told in relation to uh, what is causing their symptoms as opposed to what is being diagnostically defined and so i think many of us who again work in disease clinics will have had referrals from primary care where the initial thought is many as disease and once we then go and investigate the symptoms further and do some diagnostic tests we actually find out that that is not the underlying condition however um, often if that's what the patient has been told initially that's the umbrella term that they will hang on to to explain their, their dizziness so globally we have studies that are probably showing some prevalence of many as disease ranging from anything from 10 in 100,000 to up to 150 in 100,000 and again that really just depends on how that data was collected, uh, what tests were done to um, define the diagnosis, uh, whether it was self-reported or was actually um, collated at the, an ear, nose and throat or otolaryngology centre. So let's just talk a little bit more then about Meniere's disease itself and the, the features and characteristics. We know that really what we're talking about here are episodes of inner ear dysfunction. And as we mentioned earlier, that is going to potentially affect both the cochlea and the vestibular system. So there may be auditory vestibular uh, balance disruptions whether that's from a fluctuating hearing loss a more fixed hearing impairment tinnitus pressure or oral fullness in the ear with associated episodes of dizziness that can last from minutes to hours and a associated balance disruption whilst feeling symptomatic so really as with all of our dizzy patients the detailed history of events and also the previous medical history that allows us to consider are there any triggers to these dizzy episodes as well and that often can be an important factor when considering what may be causing or driving the symptoms for the patient and then obviously we have the assessment of inner ear function whether that's from both an auditory and vestibular perspective in suspected Meniere's disease uh, and what tests we can then employ uh, to try and capture any change that helps with the diagnosis and that then really is, is key in differentiating the considerations of competing conditions. Fortunately, it's not too uncommon that the patient may actually be experiencing two conditions. And really the challenge then is to define which of those conditions is actually driving the, the symptoms so that appropriate medical or surgical management can be employed to lessen the impact. So when considering the differential of Meniere's disease, the list is relatively long. We can see a couple of common ones here that, that do sit within our clinics. And one that we can draw our attention to really is vestibular migraine as being probably the most prevalent uh, condition that we see that relates to episodic dizziness and also one that has in the literature, and we'll discuss this a little bit more in detail as well, has in the literature the greatest mimic of Meniere's disease and its associated symptoms. Let, let's talk about how we classify Meniere's disease. Now, the classification has been a challenge for uh, those specialists working within this field for many, many years. And there's certainly been collaborative efforts globally with Japan and the USA and other uh, specialist areas to try to come together with a degree of classification that allows the uh, conditions to be identified and appropriately managed. And certainly if we, we look at the 1995, which was probably the biggest classification uh, publication based on originally the 72 uh, classifications of the 85, both from Japan and the USA. In these classification documents, really many as disease is defined as being either certain, definite, probable or possible. And each of these have a particular sequence of 
factors that need to be considered to classify whether the condition is actually present. If we take, for example, definite here. So for definite in the 1995 guideline, we had to have had two or more definite spontaneous episodes of, of vertigo, spinning, dizziness, hallucination of movement, as we know, for 20 minutes or longer, with at least some audiometrically documented hearing loss on one occasion, with some reported tinnitus or oral fullness in the treated ear. And all other causes of those symptoms had to have been excluded. When we look at probable, then we start to get to where the lines get a little bit blurry because we've got one defined uh, episode of vertigo, um, again, potentially some audiometric documented hearing loss on at least one occasion, and also the associated tinnitus, oral fullness, and other causes. Uh, for the end classification, um, we have a possible, which is some episodic vertigo of a menu's type without any hearing change being documented or fluctuation with disequilibrium but without definitive episodes and other causes excluded. So we can see that actually under that umbrella of Menier's disease we've got quite a range of different dizziness presentations and histories that could still be classified into one of the four um, and obviously the more we get into the probable and possible the more that competing or mimicking conditions are getting mixed into that and we can see that how that then probably influenced some of the prevalence data that we've just looked at in terms of the numbers being skewed those guidelines have been uh, reviewed uh, and updated 2015 the criteria for diagnosis of Meniere's disease really was brought down into definite or probable with definite being two or more episodes now being defined as lasting 20 minutes to 12 hours with audiometrically documented low to mid frequency sensor neural loss in at least one ear uh, defining that as the affected ear on at least one occasion before, during, or after the episode of, of dizziness. Fluctuating oral symptoms, both hearing tinnitus or fullness in the affected ear, and again, no better accounted for by another vestibular diagnosis. Now, probable obviously has less features to it, so again, that still has to have two or more episodes of dizziness, again, lasting for anywhere between 20 minutes uh, to 24 hours, with fluctuating oral symptoms. So again, um, hearing tinnitus or fullness in the affected ear. That really now slims that down to um, helping us define uh, more clear cases of Meniere's disease from those that are presenting with other mimicking episodic dizziness. Um, but again, as we can see, that was only from 2015. The prevalence data for that will take some time to come through in terms of the epidemiology of, of Meniere's disease under the newer criteria. OK, uh, having spoken about the challenge then of, of this elusive and mimicking conditions, let's think about the, the clinical challenge of obtaining evidence to support a diagnosis. So having thought now about the definite and probable, obviously we've taken the reported history from the patient. We've got some understanding that we think that this may be an inner ear issue. And also we've got the red flag, I guess, that's telling us that we think that that may be related to a Meniere's type condition. So how do we then go about getting the evidence to, um, to help bring that diagnosis home? First challenge is really capturing evidence of, of hearing fluctuation any audiometric change that allows us to um, characterize this as being more of a peripheral end organ dysfunction is really our next uh, or first uh, clinical challenge. Employing pewto and audiometry, we can look for those characteristic low frequency fluctuations or even low frequency fixed sensory neural hearing deficits in what would be then defined as the affected ear. We can look at speech testing. Certainly in the latter part of Meniere's disease, we see that there is a reported uh, issue around recruitment and speech discrimination de deterioration. That often isn't very clear at the very early part. So really at the very early presentations, we're looking at these pure tone audiometric changes in the low frequency. In, in the past, and obviously we've got reference here from 1966, however, this was employed, at least to my memory, I remember being a fairly newly qualified audiologist working uh, in an ENT uh, otolaryngology clinic and doing audiometric assessments for patients with suspected Meniere's disease. And one of the tests that we used to employ back then was looking at the glycerol test with, with audiometry. Now, for those of you that are not necessarily familiar with that test, the glycerol dehydration test, basically the patient was uh, put on um, osmotic diuretic Basically, the patient would be fasted for around three hours. Um, a baseline audiogram would be performed 
uh, the glycerol would be mixed with some water and given orally to the patient. And then what we would do is sequential audiometric testing at uh, roughly 80 minutes uh, or 90 minutes uh, and 180 minutes. So roughly an hour and a half to three hours after ingestion. The test was considered to be positive if there was an improvement of approximately 10 dB or more in the pubertone thresholds at two or more frequencies, generally in the lower frequency end, so the 250 to 2000 hertz, or of an improvement of around 10% in speech discrimination scores. Unfortunately, um, those tests, the glycerol dehydration tests, really had some fairly um, significant side effects for the patient. Anything from headache to nausea to vomiting to dizziness, uh, you know, in general feeling quite unwell. Its sensitivity was relatively low, reported somewhere around about 40, 50, 60 percent. However, if you did get a positive value, it's very specific and did um, show some change then in the inner ear structure that would be related to Meniere's disease. As you can imagine, uh, the acceptance of that test, both in terms of the duration of time it took to administer and the fact that it wasn't overly pleasant to do, and still with a relatively low rate of sensitivity, it's not something that probably is routinely employed in clinic these days. Now, the next challenge is really trying to capture some clinical evidence of vestibular dysfunction. We know that we can look at video head impulse testing to really get a, a very quick snapshot, a quite convincing snapshot of semicircular canal function, looking at the vestibular ocular reflexes in relation to head movement. And that really does give us some very quick insights into what the behavior is of each of those peripheral end organs relative to head rotation from the semicircular canals. Um, we can use the chloric test to look at ear specific sensitivity uh, of the um, vestibular system. Uh, again, we know that this is really just the lateral horizontal semicircular canal pathway through the superior vestibular nerve. However, it, it does give us a low frequency test as opposed to a V-hit, which we think of more as a high frequency vestibular test. And then something that, that most of us will be familiar with, if not done or conducted recently, is evoke potential testing. Now, often, um, certainly in the past, there is a large body of evidence looking at electrocochleography in relation to um, uh, trying to establish endolymphatic high drops in the inner ear structures. And again, we'll, we'll briefly touch upon that today just to bring us up to date and refresh ourselves into terms of how that can be also employed in the clinical setting. So what does the literature then tell us around some of these diagnostic uh, tests? Well, if we look at um, Google um, and Google Scholar, as some of us will certainly do on a regular basis, trying to keep our knowledge up to date. And we just type in the term Meniere's disease. And if we just limit that to 2018, we'll find that there are 1,430 articles that sit on those pages in relation to that particular condition. Whilst this has been around since 1861, we can just get a feel for the impact that this is having in our clinical um, uh, fields by the still of body of or volume of publications that are coming out in relation to this particular condition. If we take that and slim it down to something more peer reviewed and published and look at PubMed, even limited to 2018, there's 193 articles that have been published on PubMed in relation to Meniere's disease. Now, if we just take PubMed as being more of a, a scientific peer review publication uh, database and look at those publications on Meniere's disease by year, um, what we can basically see, uh, I think if, you, if we're looking at this slide, is a trend from the right to the left of some of the earlier publications right up to 2018, um, where we're seeing up to, um, uh, particularly in 2018-19, uh, 208 publications uh, for many years disease. And we can see that that trend is gradually increasing over time. So this isn't something that we know everything about um, because we're still exploring that. And the research um, base um, certainly is developing and evolving over time as well. And that's evident in the publications that we're, we're seeing uh, being uh, brought out for us to review. So let's have a little look more about the, the literature itself. Um, what we certainly see in the literature is some confusion. And this came around the video head impulse test um, being employed 
and initially thought of as uh, a replacement for the chloric test. But there is some disassociation between the chloric and the head impulse test in Meniere's disease. So this study by McGarvey, et al. and the Sydney group accepted that actually the mechanism of chloric stimulation could account for the association with the increased diameter of the semicircular duct in hydropic labyrinth resulting in endolymph uh, circulation within the duct itself, so smaller thermal property across the cupula. So basically what that says in, in essence is that certainly at the lower frequency end of vestibular function, we may see due to a volume change, and we'll try and have a look at a few slides in a moment that looks at the volume of endolymphatic changes can create that may be sensitive to a chloric test, for example, creating a canal paresis, a hyperfunction, where when we look at very quicker rotations through the video, video head impulse test, they're not initially um, quite so evident. So again, thinking that just because we have a normal video head impulse test, particularly in patients with sp suspected menus, that may not actually be telling us everything we need to know about the underlying vestibular function. And looking again, we can explore that a bit more in VHIT with patients who have had definite Meniere's disease. So by the characterization of the guideline for 2015, again, we've talked about the McGarvey uh, paper just there in a bit more detail, but we've got um, McCaslin also had three patients that demonstrated moderate to flat centroneural hearing losses, had significant chloric asymmetries, but bilaterally they had normal video head impulse testing. So again, that probably fits in with the same pattern that McGarvey et al. were also describing. Uh, Lee et al. reported some wildly variable results in, in 14 of their patients that during attacks of Meniere's disease, where the gain uh, of the VOR um, either was normal, decreased or increased. And again, that may come down to the sensitivity and aggravation of the vestibular system itself whilst undergoing a Meniere's episode. And a 2017 study there uh, by Codero Lianza, um, looking at 88 patients that have had abnormal chloric responses uh, in some patients, um, while VHIT was abnormal in others. Um, and identify that the agreement between the both tests were actually was quite poor. So again, what we have there are two different tools looking at vestibular function at different frequencies that both have value when we're trying to uh, define what is happening within the peripheral system itself. So chloric stimulation of head impulse test in many as disease and vestibular migraine. So now we're moving a little bit more into mimicking conditions. And I think it would be fair to say that literature supports vestibular migraine as probably being the greatest mimicker of quite a few different vestibular pathologies, but is probably the greatest mimic of Meniere's disease. In this particular study uh, in 2014, both the bithermal chloric test and the video head impulse test were more abnormal in Meniere's disease than in vestibular migraine. So this was now looking at, at patients presenting with episodic dizziness and trying to identify a peripheral vestibular change that may be then more associated with Meniere's disease than vestibular migraine. However, hold that thought a little bit because we're going to talk a little bit more about vestibular migraine and migraine-associated vertigo further into today's webinar. So why do patients with early stage Meniere's disease show non-pathological VHIT? We've already proposed one model from uh, Australia, from McGarvey, this Gentine model looking at volume changes that may change endolymphatic flow and affect the, um, uh, the chloric test more than VHIT test. In terms of looking at episodic vertigo and suspected Meniere's disease, really what, what we're saying is we need to consider initially pr probably as a lot of us will now do, perform a VHIT as our first test to have a look at semicircular canal function but also depending on what that test is telling us, not to discount performing chloric testing. And certainly anecdotally in uh, my clinic, uh, when we were seeing somewhere between 1,000 to 2,000 patients uh, a year with various forms of dizziness, whilst we saw after we um, instigated the use of VHIT as one of our first testing um, challenges uh, when looking at dizzy patients, we saw a decrease in the use of the chloric test what we saw was we were still performing quite a few chloric tests in trying to identify any underlying peripheral uh, conditions as well, uh, particularly again in the confounding patients of Meniere's migraine-associated vertigo and vestibular migraine. 
So yes, yeah, so we need to be aware that neither the VHIT or the chloric are gold standard tests for Meniere's disease. And certainly if we're trying to differentiate mimicking conditions, and in this relationship we're talking about migraine from Meniere's, then just screening on a VHIT would be dangerous. And really we need to consider that differential testing approach. And again, we'll explore that in a bit more in when we look at evoked potentials as well. Some of us will be familiar with vestibular evoked myogenic potentials and certainly uh, looking at Meniere's and migraine patients there has been lots of research done and um, by frequency tuning curve comparison so looking at the size of the vent responses at 500 hertz and 1000 hertz um, in patients with suspected Meniere's disease. And there is very clear um, evidence that the 1000 hertz VEMP being larger than the 500 hertz VEMP in uh, patients with, with Meniere's disease. The caveat to that is obviously Meniere's is a condition that um, has a certain siliqui and if we're close to an episode then the changes are much more likely to be evident in our testing. Also, we can look into oral asymmetry ratios in vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease to look at any changes at the peripheral end organ uh, that would account for uh, a more inner ear um, pathology. Now, that brings us back into electrocogliography. And certainly for those of us that have worked in audiology for some time, we'll probably remember using electrocogliography pre-routine ABR to establish the presence of a permanent hearing loss. And obviously alongside that, we probably recall uh, doing theater trans tympanic measurements, looking at endolymphatic high drops. And obviously with the development of less invasive clinical tests, we found that actually we could do uh, much more um, testing in the lab without having to resort to some of the more invasive uh, evoked potential testing that we've done in the past. However, electrocogliography is really a very good test to look at the stimulus related potentials from the peripheral portion of the auditory system. And in this case, we're, we're considering it in relation to Meniere's disease. The potentials, just to remind us, um, are the cochlear microphonic, um, and in particular, we're going to be looking at summating potentials and the cap or AP action potentials in relation to um, changes in the endolymphatic system. So what this looks like when we when we measure it is we, we get this characteristic waveform, which we can then um, identify the action potential and the summating potential. Uh, and use those two measurements really as the basis of looking for endolymphatic high drops. We can look at that both from an amplitude ratio where we mark the baseline on the, uh, the summating potential and the action potential. And then our EP systems can create a calculation that compares the relate ratio between the two and then can define whether we have something that is of an increased ratio that may be relative to Meniere's disease or endolymphatic eye drops. And again, we've got work. There's a quite a large body of work, but the what, the one article we're reporting here is the Ferraro and Durant 2006, where sensitivity um, is being reported with this particular technique of amplitude ratio measurement of around 60%, uh, but increasing to close to 90% when the patient or close to when the patient is symptomatic. The other technique that we have started to move to using now uh, is area ratio measurement. So again, within our EP system, what we can do is we can mark where our um, baseline start, baseline end is. And effectively, what we're looking at again is this SPAP complex. And we're trying to measure the relationship, the extension of that complex that would be related to endolymphatic high drops. So an example here that we can see on the left is just a, a normal um, area calculation in ECOG. Um, and on the right, what we can see is this large movement of the complex. So if we look at the relationship between the SP and the AP um, and the area increase, that, that is more characteristic then of what we define as endolymphatic high drops or uh, one of the key components to Meniere's disease. And what we have is some area calculations and amplitude calculations that be uh, that can identify um, abnormality within that um, within that measurement. And really, we've got um, some normative values that again identify that 
greater than 0 0.53 in terms of the amplitude ratio would then start to be a significant value or greater than 1.94. And I know that Ferraro often uh, uses the magic number of two in, uh, in their clinic with um, uh, area calculations being greater than being very much consistent with endolymphatic high drops and obviously um, have then clinical evidence of Meniere's disease-like presentations. So what does that look like? So uh, it's very hard to get images of endolymphatic high drops and even in the gandolinium MRI um, infused measurements, there's still some degree of sensitivity that um, has not really brought that up as, as really a gold standard test. However, if we look at these images here that um, have kindly shared uh, by Kirchhoff et al in 2015, what we can see is here is this is a, a normal looking um, inner ear space. So we can see that the inner ear um, is defined, the endolymphatic space is defined by that yellow um, outline with the green outline um, identifying the semicircular uh, canal. And what we can base it of, this, of the vestibular system. And what we can see there is this is um, endolymphatic ratio under ECOG of 0 0.35. So just it's underneath what would be described as, as a positive finding but could, I guess, be described as a mild endolymphatic high drops. However, if we then compare that to, um, to a much higher ratio, so here what we're seeing is a much larger space. And I just wanted to share that to give you some visualization of what we're referring to in terms of endolymphatic high drops and the invasion of space that that um, overproduction of endolymph or poor absorption of endolymph, whatever the pathophysiology might actually be, creates within that inner ear structure. If we look at those side to side, we can see that actually there's quite a characteristic difference there in terms of um, just the actual volume uh, in relation to what we're measuring then in an ECOG. So what I would like to to show you is some resources um, that you could go to and have a look at on uh, the Interacoustics Academy website. So we've got lots of ECOG resources there for you to take a look at and um, uh, look through all lasting a few minutes at a time from quick guides to just overviews. So if that's something that you're considering reconsidering for your area or clinical practice, then um, certainly there's lots there in relation to TM trod measurements. So measuring from electrodes just placed on the tympanic membrane, not trans tympanic and getting very good, reliable um, ECOG measurements in a, in a clinic rather than in a theatre environment. OK, we're coming to, towards the end of uh, today's uh, webinar. And what we'd like to do then is is look at some of the newer theories in relation to the pathophysiology. So I think we've established that Menier's disease pathophysiology remains pretty elusive. We've talked around some of the challenges from a clinical perspective, both from an autometric and vestibular perspective, both from evoked potentials, uh, video head impulse measurements from the eye movements, from video oculography, and also from chloric stimulation measured under video nystagmography. However, we've got some work here coming out from uh, New Zealand, looking at um, studies that have as we initially said, indicate that the age of onset of Menier's disease has a very similar pattern to that of benign paroxysmal positioning vertigo. One proposal that has been put is that, that the trigger to Menier's disease could actually, so the etiology, etiologic factor, as we, we discussed earlier, could be a result of detached saccular autocornea, causing a blockage, initiating the cochlear eye drops, which develops and moves into the saccule. So again, if we recall earlier, we were talking about the endolymphatic sac, the duct and the endolymphatic sac acting as almost a cleaning or cleansing mechanism within the inner ear structures, removing debris out of the um, actual system itself. And if that then became blocked by larger pieces of autocornea, this in itself could then trigger um, changes in the endolymphatic system itself, which obviously subsequently has some of the other symptomatic changes that we've described in Menier's disease. Um, so that's one of the proposals that's, that's come. And then the other part which Hornenbrook and Bird uh, have also proposed is that as this, as more autocornea then is released from the damaged saccular system, so thinking here that the detached saccular autocornea causing a blockage, 
initiating a change in potentially the, the endolymph or the ionic concentration, uh, the potassium mix particularly, causing more rotoconia to be re re released from the saccule, the damaged saccule, moving towards the utricular and obstructing that endolymphatic duct itself, uh, causing then the, this change in the homeostasis within the system and uh, instigating Meniere's disease. Now, there is quite a large body of evidence looking at the association of migraine, vestibular migraine and Meniere's disease. And i um, just got a couple of articles that I'd like to share with you that give us a little bit of insight into how some of those particular conditions may then influence the inner ear or peripheral system's function and may then fit with some of the pathophysiologic uh, considerations that we've considered just a moment ago with Honingbrook and Bird's study looking at BPBV maybe being an etiological factor for Meniere's disease. So thinking about vestibular systems um, in vestibular migraine, these are often thought about as an aura caused by uh, the spread of um, what is called the cortical spreading depression. So this is um, in neurophysiological terms, uh, almost thinking of a spread of wave like um, electrical silence in the cortical, um, switching off the neurons and creating some silence. This initially is often um, preceded by some um, hyperactivity followed by a wave of inhibition. And certainly what what that has been um, considered in relation to um, to migraine is how that influences then potentially the vestibular nuclei and the other cortices and the activation of other areas such as the, the thalamus um, creating the faulty sensory integration that is often reported in, in, in migraine. Um, other vascular theories uh, look at um, issues around the um, trigeminal vascular system. So the trigeminal nerve, um, which directly affects the inner ear blood flow, creating changes in the cochlear vascular through this innov innovation uh, pathway. And again, that fits with uh, certainly considering other drivers to symptoms of Meniere's disease being changes that could be occurring elsewhere, whether it's or a cornea blocking uh, areas within the flow of endolymph or production of endolymph that creates the conditions for Meniere's disease, or here considering um, centrally mediated efferent pathways disrupting the peripheral end organ and creating the factors that then can subsequently escalate up to a Meniere's type condition. So this provides a mechanism which the activation of that TVS, uh, the trigeminal vascular system, in migraine could cause a peripheral uh, vestibular dysfunction. Um, and again, we have studies that have certainly measured both um, changes in um, vestibular hyperfunction in patients with um, auditory uh, conditions. And we've got plenty of data that sub suggests subclinical changes in cochlear function auditory pathways that have been associated um, with chronic migraine and the uh, blood supply of the auditory system. Again, this study here looking at migraine associated vertigo um, and sharing pathophysiology uh, with Meniere's disease. There's demonstrated pathophysiological changes in both Meniere's disease and migraine associated vertigo. So in actual fact, these are there are implications that changes in inner ear physiology may be occurring in patients experiencing central disruptions, which may then have some evidence around um, these efferent disruptions to the vestibular system being the etiological factor that then creates the Meniere's disease and becomes more of the, the fixed peripheral condition. What does the literature tell us about associated factors for Meniere's disease? Well, reviewing the literature that we've covered today in the webinar, what we can certainly say is that Meniere's disease and its etiology certainly remains elusive. And that's something that's referenced quite frequently in the literature. However, we've looked at certain factors that may actually be triggers for Meniere's disease. And more recently, those triggers are often things that maybe we have thought of as being secondary to endolymphatic eye drops or Meniere's disease in the past, such as BPPV or maybe migraine uh, and migraine associated vertigo. So really this episodic vertigo now is is part and parcel of what is the instigating factor? Is it that we have something that's occurring 
that's disrupting the peripheral vestibular system, maybe through the efferent pathway or even within the structure itself, as we've discussed within BPPV, that's then causing symptoms of uh, dizziness that subsequently left untreated creates a factor change, an etiological factor change that disrupts that endolymphatic homeostasis. And that then can create the conditions that will then lead to the much more significant changes such as Menier's disease. So that's the that's the kind of the driver then to the symptoms that we have on here. So that leaves us with a diagnostic challenge. Really what we're trying to do is gather the evidence of where uh, physiology uh, and change has occurred within that system, but often trying to then find how that fits with the reported history of the patient to really determine what's driving the symptoms that they're presently experiencing. Is it something further up within the central vestibular mechanisms that's causing changes down at the inner ear organ? And if that's the case, then obviously we, we need to consider the management of that. Or is it actually occurring in the peripheral end organ that's creating enough sensory disruption that secondary factors such as migraine may then be augmented? So really, this is now looking at our tools. Obviously, we've discussed a few tools today in terms of looking at audiometry and trying to factor in hearing the video head impulse test and its role in terms of looking at semicircular canal function, both eye monitoring under VNG and chloric, and also evoke potentials such as vestibular evoke myogenic potentials, electrocogliography. And obviously what we're trying to do is find that, that set of symptoms that the individual within the, the whole range of uh, patients that we see with episodic vertigo have that defined pathology so that we can instigate correct management and look at uh, what we expect to happen uh, in terms of their prognosis. So really to summarise today's webinar and, and certainly our knowledge around episodic vertigo in the context of Menier's disease, we have several tools available for investigation and it's really bringing those tools together that increases the sensitivity and specificity of locating certain pathologies. So each tool in its own has a role, but really there's no real gold standard tool. And it's bringing that combination together to really fine tune and almost isolate other um, pathologies to identify what may be going on with the peripheral end organ. But obviously that's the issue of finding location. Is it actually an episodic vertigo that's a peripheral or is it a mimicking factor from the central system? And again, that changes the considerations we have around management. And that leaves us then with treatment, because as we know, uh, treating a vestibular migraine is very different to treating a peripheral end organ condition such as Menier's disease. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and listen to today's webinar. Again, we have lots of resources available on the Interacoustics Academy website, and we're always interested to hear your thoughts around either the webinars that we have already presented or any topics that you may want in the future that you think may be worthy for us to consider to broaden our to broaden our portfolio of educational resources. So please feel free to drop us a line um, on Academy Interacoustics and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar. Goodbye.